Dr. Professor Kavi Arya to inaugurate and commence our event for the day. So I think over to you, sir. Yes, thank you. Um, let me share my screen. Uh, one minute. I wonder if you can see my screen now. Yes, sir, we can see it. You, uh, I hope it's not being obstructed by any um, other graphics. Um, no, it's fine, sir. OK, great. So uh, welcome to the second edition of the virtual museum competition. And uh, like all the other Eantra events, we try and train students in really cool stuff through a project-based learning approach, learning by doing. And here we took a, we departed from the usual themes of Eantra, where we normally talk about technology, things like uh, robotics and embedded systems and learning programming and stuff like that. Um, we were challenged to kind of address different areas. So we chose the humanities, and most particularly, we chose history. Now, why history? Um, this is something that engineers would really sort of, it would do them good to understand why the humanities are an essential part of education. It's interesting that Olin College, which is a prime engineering college in, uh, in the US, has most of the engineering subjects as optional, but the only two compulsory subjects there are history and English literature. Now, why so? Because we believe that history trains you in the art of, of critical thinking. And what that is will emerge as our presentation continues. So our vision is we have a DIY museum that we uh, want to build by the students, for the students. And we made a little video to kind of illustrate uh, the launch of this competition. Welcome to the virtual museum competition hosted by e at IIT Bombay. It's a unique competition for students at school level where you learn while you compete. Following the success of our robotics and programming competitions, we move to humanities to explore how to make studying history more interesting. Teaching history in a conventional manner has been a challenge, since it's seen as memorizing events and dates which bear little relevance to our lives. We believe that the study of history is highly relevant. Students from grades 7 to 12 participate online in a seven-week virtual museum competition where they are taught history using technology. They are trained to use graphical, analytical and research techniques to tell stories by designing a virtual museum exhibit with mentors from the Eantra project. So what are the benefits? The benefits are that history is made more interesting. We learn trending technologies. We learn digital design skills and design thinking. We learn teamwork and we learn the relevance of conserving history. We cultivate a curiosity about our past that goes on to awaken a self-esteem, but most importantly, it trains us in critical thinking skills, the ability to work with data, and to solve real problems. So join us to celebrate the work of students exploring history using technology. Join us to explore history made more interesting for generations to come. To know more about this, visit our website, school.e-yantra.org. <laughs> Jai Hind. So that's that. So how do we do that? How do we make history relevant? First, we tried to make it personal, right? We made all the students do a family genealogy and we found parents were very excited because the children sat next to their grandparents and made sure that they extracted every ounce of historical stories out of them 
Um, no need to add here that the grandparents were delighted at having had these stories pulled out of them. And that shows you how interesting each family's history is. And we told the students to tell the story of their own genealogy in a wow manner, such that it makes it interesting to others. Just imagine the effect that would have both on the children and on the families. And then we try to make genealogy and history relevant in terms of time and space. And then we try and relate that knowledge to other spheres. And everybody knows that the best way to take ownership of knowledge is to look at it from many different angles and connect it to everything else that you know. So the sorts of things that the students learned in the process, right, was things like research methodology. How do you research? How do you uh, rigorously look at evidence because a historian sees evidence of various kinds. It can be something that somebody said or something that's written, or you can be faced by the artifact in front of you. And each of these things needs to be given a different kind of weightage. So how do you do research? How do you cite research? Right? Things like that. How do you work as a team? How do you divide the work up? How do you communicate between the teams? How do you communicate with the outside world? Like, for instance, we found some students from Bhutan in the last edition, went out searching for relics and they found an innkeeper in Paro who had a beautiful armor, an ancient armor, which was used by his family. And he was very happy to model it for them. So they went out into the world looking for interesting evidence. And then how to engage this, how to connect your, your school curriculum to this. And how do you learn all these technologies with, with, with which to bring these stories alive? Because the stories are very exciting. And most importantly, in the middle of all this drama is the idea of critical thinking. And critical thinking is a fundamental skill. Critical thinking is what a lot of humanities and engineering is really all about. So what does, for instance, an IAS officer do, an administrator who has to see how successfully a government scheme has worked? He has evidence from the ground. And then you have to piece together this evidence to find out what really must be the story on the ground. We know that engineers are very good at solving problems, but more important than solving problems is knowing which problem to solve. Critical thinking, that's what it's all about. And that's not really given as much weight as we should at schools. So solving history and studying history trains us in critical thinking. So we've tried to, in this project, uh, introduced youngsters to documenting and analyzing history. Everybody knows that the Indian civilization, for, uh, for example, has not been as good as documenting and analyzing history as they've been doing it in the West. So here's where we are trying to inculcate a scientific temper, a curiosity, and a research outlook in the students. We are trying to improve the process of documentation, showing them the importance of documenting your, your research. And looking at interesting problems which come along the way, it could be problems about how do you scan an image of an object or how you kind of use technology or how do you tell a story and all sorts of things. And all these improve your critical thinking abilities. So our vision is that we believe that the world, not only India, is comprises of an exponentially, at least India is an exponentially growing economy with a very young population. And this population needs to be equipped with the skills to solve the many, many problems that we have in a growing economy. So we need innovators and innovators with a mindset for change from the very school level who are armed with contemporary skills and contemporary knowledge. And our way is that we train these youngsters in both these hard, which is STEM kind of skills, and now it's STEAM skills, including art in it, and soft skills of various kinds. So we achieve this by training them and trying to create a change of outlook to create thinkers. We try to encourage curiosity. We try to encourage them to subject everything to the scrutiny of reason. You don't have to accept anything. Question, 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 and find out why things are as they are. And then also to create a knowledge and skill set for the, the future, things like technology and AI and all these kind of things that are there, which make life very exciting right now. And most importantly, we feel that doing this kind of study creates an interest in your own background, in your own culture, creates a self-esteem, which is most important for anybody who wants to do something interesting in life. 
Okay, so we've we've been fairly experienced in the college space in the sense that we've trained almost two lakh students. That's two hundred thousand plus students in engineering colleges. We've worked with almost over three thousand colleges, but in schools, we've just begun a couple of years ago. We've we've reached out to about seventy-seven schools and about four hundred plus students. We are we are still in the process of of honing our skill set as to how to make study of any kind, whether it's um, programming, robotics, mathematics, STEM subjects, and now history, interesting, right? So that's where we are now. And this is the growth of our uh, robotics competition. As you can see, we went from 4,000 in 2012 to almost 35,000 in 2019. True, it went down in COVID, and, but it's begun to exponentially grow again. And a lot of these youngsters who participated in, in our competitions have got very good jobs. They've gone to the best universities to do postgraduate degrees. They've done startups of various kinds. These are a few of the startups that they've done. The last one, incidentally, is a robotic rehabilitation startup where in physiotherapy, you need a machine to kind of exercise you in various ways. These guys have built that kind of a device. So... Coming back to our history competition and what we've done in this in this uh, project of ours, the virtual museum project, we've centered everything around telling the story about an artifact. You choose an artifact and then you tell a story about the art artifact. And in the telling of the story, you create a virtual museum exhibit in the 3D world, right? But the most important thing I'll tell you again is the story. So the narrative, the story should be interesting. It should have a wow factor, which your friends love to see. And it should be authentic. That means you should cite your sources. And technology is just the enabler in this whole thing. So the whole thing is tell a unique story about that artifact through an exhibit, right? So a wow story. And you chart that story spatially. That means geography-wise and across time, right? What is the relevance of that? Map it to your curriculum and tell us what else is happening in the world. And in our research, we want you to think like an, a historian. Cite your sources, give them weight, identify problems along the way, solve them as you go along. And we give marks for things like innovation and resourcefulness and things like that. To measure how well we have succeeded at this game, we have uh, a bunch of 15 of the finalist exhibits from this uh, uh, edition of the competition. And uh, these kids at the end get a little prize like this, which is the E-Yantra mascot. Uh, <coughs> his name is Ian, And it's not a coincidence that uh, he got, he has the same, same, same name as uh, my PhD advisor from Oxford, Ian Page. So there it is. And uh, we are delighted to be here with you to share the, to celebrate the success of the students. And it's very interesting. We found that almost every, every project, every team came up with something beautiful. It was very difficult to shortlist them, but now you'll see why. So without much ado, I'll hand the floor back to Karen to take the story from here. And I'm delighted that uh, a Professor Dinesh Singh has joined us. Hi, Dinesh. Hi, sorry, Kavi. I was in another meeting that overshot. Yes, you Forgive you me for being late. Okay. Yes, our big shots are blessed with many many meetings that they have to attend in the day. But uh, before we start, uh, uh, let me just introduce uh, who we have here with us today. So first, I'll just introduce you to who our uh, uh, jury members have been. We had a, a professor Sugan Malotra, who's my uh, college, my colleague at IIT Bombay. He's a PhD in design from the uh, Instrument Design and Development Center at IIT Delhi. And he's a faculty in IDC, in the uh, Industrial Design Center uh, at IIT Bombay. And he's got about 16 years of experience in uh, industrial design and automotive styling. And he's won lots of awards nationally, internationally, and so on. And then we ha have uh, Miss, Mrs. Richa Varma, who is the principal of 7i World School, a CBSE school in Gwalior. And she's done her MA in English Literature and Education. And she's got 29 years experience and mentored students of various hues, 
and kinds. And she's been a keynote speaker at many conferences on teaching, learning, school development, and education, and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, lastly, we had uh, Professor Siddhi Deshpande, uh, who is an assistant prof at St. Xavier's College in Bombay, who teaches uh, the MA program of ancient Indian culture. And she has about eight years of teaching experience there. And her background is in ancient Indian culture and archaeology. And her PhD is also in archaeology. And she has uh, studied the visual narratives in sculptures uh, depicting, you know, childhood stories of Krishna in Rajasthan and so on. So these were the three jury members who very diligently went through all the entries and came up with this list of final 15 that we uh, have here with you, with uh, us. So I'll be asking uh, Siddhi to kind of give her reactions in our interaction time. So uh, uh, Professor Dinesh, we are keeping things informal. We'll yeah. first have all the kids uh, present what they've done. And then at the end, we thought we'll give everybody a chance, our friends like yourself, uh, the opportunity to kind of help us understand what has been achieved. So now, last but not least, I'd like to sort of introduce our two special guests, our guests of honor, Professor Dinesh Singh and uh, Professor Seema Bawa. Um, I'll start with uh, uh, Seema Ji. She's a uh, head of Department of History in University of Delhi since uh, the, uh, 2014, and she's a PhD uh, uh, from uh, Delhi, National Museum Institute, Delhi, and the University of Bonn in 2004, and she's done her master's in uh, Delhi University, and she's done her uh, undergraduate and postgraduate at Lady uh, Sriram College. Uh, most importantly, she's specialized in the history of South Asian art and culture and the iconography. And she's worked on Western Himalayan art, religion, and contemporary Indian art also. And she's extensively lectured, as you'd understand, in India and abroad on Indian art and architecture and things like that, and researched also extensively in this area. And currently, I believe she's working on the history of post-independence art in India and uh, Gupta and post-Gupta Shaivism in Northern India and so on. We'd like to hear a little bit about that. And uh, the other person I'd like to introduce is uh, Professor Dinesh Singh. Uh, he was a PhD student at Imperial College many, many years ago when I was an undergraduate. Uh, after that, he became a lecturer in St. Stephen's College at the University of Delhi. And he joined uh, the Department of Mathematics in 87. He became the head, then the director, and then he became the vice chancellor uh, in 2010. And he's a very distinguished mathematician who's worked on things like exotic things like functional analysis, operator theory, harmonic analysis, and so on. He continues to be an active researcher. He is also Padma Shri, which is the fourth highest civilian honor awarded by the Republic of India. And we know him most importantly for his very interesting brainchild, uh, the Cluster Innovation Center in Delhi University, which was an first, it was an interdisciplinary first of its kind research center, which promoted undergraduate research, right, which is very rarely done in this country, right, and he's been awarded uh, severally as um, uh, he's got a career award in mathematics from the UGC and AMU prize of Indian Mathematical Society. He went to Imperial college to pursue his PhD with an INLAX scholarship. And he's a member of the Scientific Advisory Committee to the Union Cabinet of Government of India. He's a member let's, of... Let's not lose time, Kavi. Yes, but I'd like to just introduce our friends here. And uh, I'll also informally introduce uh, Professor Ian Page, um, who was my PhD advisor at Oxford. And he's an expert in reprogrammable re, uh, uh, hardware, FPGAs. He came up with some very innovative uh, computer architectures way back in 1983 when these things were hardly around. And uh, he came up with a very innovative engine called Disputer. I won't go into the details of that, using the Transputer, which was a chip very much ahead of its time. So let's say that he's a, a serial innovator in the space of chip design, which is becoming more and more important as uh, 
time goes on. So without much ado, I would like to just hand the floor back to Karen to uh, proceed. Lastly, I'd like to just add that Ian has been a very enthusiastic supporter of uh, the Eantra project. He's been in with us, attending our events from the beginning. And I'm gratified that he's found it extremely meaningful and uh, delighted that this actually works. So more from him later. And uh, over to Karen, or is it Madhu? Uh, me, sir. Okay, go on. Yeah, so I'll just begin to share my screen again. Um, yeah, so uh, as Professor Arya said, uh, our competition is an attempt to bridge the gap between science and technology with the subjects of humanities, and our competition is curated to do just so with the subject of history. Uh, we started off our competition, as Sir said, by introducing history to the students in a way that they could relate to it more personally. And I feel that there's no more personal way than with their own family history. So they were asked to make a video and trace their roots as far back as they could go. And uh, this got them to connect with their family on a more deeper level and understand how the subject of history is so closely connected to our lives than we give it credit for. Uh, over the competition, over the course of the competition, uh, they learn skills like photogrammetry, what to uh, what to do and what not to do. They were introduced to the world of 3D modeling through software of Blender. They also learned video editing and how to do college level research. At the end of the competition, uh, they produced amazing work through the submission of a research article, a Blender exhibition and a video that talked about their artifact and uh, which can be seen on our website as shown on the screen. It's called Virtual Museum uh, uh, website. Uh, with this, we would like to take you through our finalist submissions and uh, you can sit back and enjoy the video and maybe pick up a thing or two about our rich Indian heritage. Uh, we can't hear the audio. Oh, okay. Just give me a minute. Is it audible now? Yes. yes. This, this roly poly toy was ideated in Tamil Nadu by Cholan Emperor Sarabuji. Made by sculpting, this is handmade usually using clay soil. Students research this artifact by using internet sources like YouTube videos about the toy and its historical connection to the Tanjore Brihadeshwara temple. They go on to explain the science behind making the roly-poly toy and how it balances itself and gives credit to the Tamilian toy makers. In the end, the roly-poly toy is equated to how one should live their life. However much life pushes a person around, they must always find the strength to get back up, just like the self-balancing nature of the toy. The Adhokumuda moldings presented by Sai Anish are located in the Someshwara temple, which is in the heart of the Kola region and is one of the most famous temples in this town. It was built by the Cholas who ruled this region in the 11th century and were then dethroned by the Chalukyas. The temple was later expanded by the Vijayanagar Empire and is a fine example of the Vijayanagara style of architecture. The carvings on the inner pillars of the temple have an international connection which depicts the importance and value of trade to the king. The students of Navy Children's School unravel the invigorating tales of Buddhism through the medium of a piece from the remains of the pillar in Jagannath Tekri Stupa. The present location of this artifact is in the Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj Vastu Sangralaya and can be traced back to the Satavahana Empire and is owned by the government of India.
Excavated at Pauni in Nagpur, this site was revealed to be a center of propagation of Buddhism during the Mauryan and Satavahana periods. This artifact sports Hinayana iconography like the Bodhi Vishaka, the Tree of Enlightenment, the Dhamma Chakra symbolizing the Buddhist ideology of the Eightfold Path, and the Tri Ratna symbol, a parasol that represents protection from suffering. The Ninth Ashokan Edict was created by Emperor Ashoka, the ruler of the Mauryan Empire. The artifact was created in around 250 BCE. The dimensions of the artifact are 60 into 77 into 26 centimeters and made out of basalt rock. This artifact was chosen because, according to Ishan Singhania, the inscriptions of the Mauryan Emperor Ashoka are unique, a ruler trying to unify his subjects by promoting peace and ethical conduct. Importantly, written in their regional languages and scripts was a new and unique feat. This edict was found in Nara Sopara and is written in Mauryan Brahmi. The Mukut and Dagger brought by Arav Malik's great-grandfather is a legacy that he is proud to be a part of. These artifacts are part of the traditions that are celebrated during a wedding ceremony in which the groom wears the mukut on his forehead and the dagger is held by him. They form a part of a personal heritage that is passed down from generation to generation. The mukut sports three deities, Brahma to preserve the marriage, Vishnu to create new lives together and Ganesh to remove any obstacles during the marriage. The dagger was originally carried by the groom to protect himself from decoits he might encounter during the marriage procession. This tradition is still carried out for weddings in Arav's family today. These artifacts in the end serve as a reminder of the bonds of marriage created throughout the years that brings a family together. I'm so I think we you, can I think we can go till the end of this. What do you say? Uh yeah, sure sir. What do you want to say? The copper plate inscriptions presented by the Madras Christian College Public School are broad sheets of copper held together by a thick ring and crowned by the seal of the dynasty which issued it. They usually mention grants of villages or plots of cultivable lands to private individuals or public institutions by kings. Names of monarchs, their achievements, officials, queens, princes, places, dates and much much more can be gleaned from these priceless etchings on copper, which are a mine of information for historians and archaeologists. The Chola copper plate seal grants are identified by the regal seal. All of them are bilingual, the first part composed in Sanskrit and etched in the Grantha script and the second portion in Tamil. The seal itself is a work of art. It has a tiger, the emblem of the Cholas, an umbrella and two flying whisks representing royalty, a swastika and two lamps, auspicious symbols. Besides, it has two vertical fishes, the royal emblem of the Pandyas, a bow, the Chera's emblem, and a bowl, an eastern Chaluka emblem, signifying that Rajendra Chola had conquered the Pandyas, the Cheras, and the eastern Chalukyas. Quoting Aishwarya Dhut's research article, Ahilya Bai Holkar was a very important person in Indian history. She never differentiates between people or anything else. She prepared her women's army for the war and did not even give up on Peshwa Sahib. Earlier, there was no place for women in education and social work. But by removing many rituals like the widow Sati system, she came forward to rule the natives even by being a widow. This artifact is the bust of Ahilya Bai Holkar, chosen by Aishwarya with the objectives to understand the journey of a small girl becoming a great Indian revolutionary, understanding how she took charge of an underdeveloped city like Indore and turned it into a beautiful and prosperous city. This artifact celebrates the personality that is Ahilya Bai Holkar.
Built in the 1800s, the Lucknow Residency, presented by Maas Khan, was the home of British High Commissioner during the British colonial period in Lucknow, the capital of what was then the area of Awadh. This colony was attacked in the mutiny of 1857 and suffered greatly. Today, it lies in ruins but is a major tourist attraction and a rejoice for history lovers. This important piece of history, presented by Raja Singh Kumar, originates from Sopara, an important port city in Maharashtra. Sopara is about 47 kilometers north of Mumbai. This edict is a testimony to a mission assigned to a Dhamma Rakshita to spread Buddhism and peace in the western part of Ashoka's kingdom. The language used in this edict is Mauryan Brahmi, the fragment of a larger surface that would have had the words Ashoka meant to spread throughout his kingdom is what you can see here. This particular fragment teaches about the importance of the ceremony of Dhamma while condemning other popular ceremonies. The artifact selected by Naharika Sanu for this research is an idol which is built by Kadambas of Goa who ruled Goa from the 10th to 14th century AD. This artifact is an idol of God Vishnu and Goddess Lakshmi, where Lakshmi is seated on the lap of Vishnu. This sculpture is seated in the Kamala Narayana temple, which was built around the 12th century AD, located in the district of Belgavi of North Karnataka, India. It was built by Kamala Devi, the queen of Kadamba king, Shiva Chitta Paramari in the middle of the 12th century AD. This sculpture has beautiful carvings which show the Kadamba style of architecture. The students of Mayur school selected an artifact from the Kushala period, which was sculpted in the 2nd century CE, commonly known as Chatur Mukhalinga. According to the students, the research they did for this artifact allowed them to understand Indian history deeply. Chatur Mukha Lingam essentially means a linga with four faces, representing Shiva's multiple forms, with the faces looking towards the four different directions, representing Shiva's all-knowing nature. The significance about this artifact, the facts about it, and many more things proved to be useful for them as history students. In Hinduism, Harihara is a symbolic representation of unity. Remy Chauhan presents Harihara, who is a fusion form of the two supreme gods, Lord Vishnu and Lord Shiva. The Shiva half resembles that of Arsanarishvara form, and the Vishnu counterpart has two arms bearing the Shanka and Kataka, dressed in auspicious yellow vastras. The hair in Kirita studded with precious gems as opposed to Shiva's Jatamukta. Vishnu Dharmotara Purana says that the Shiva half must have a Nandi and the Vishnu half a Garuda Vahana. It is believed that Shankara Narayana or Harihara is formed in an attempt to unite the followers of Vishnu and Shiva who follow different ideologies. The research done by Remy Chauhan attempts to rediscover the traditional beliefs surrounding the 800-year-old sculpture of Harihara, the devotional sentiments of the Hindus towards the deity, the conservation treatment used to preserve the artifact, and understand the significance and relevance of the deity in modern as well as traditional times. Brahma is worshipped in a small village of Brahma Karmali in Varpoi in Goa. The life-size statue of Brahma, presented by Sai Pranav, is exquisitely crafted, stands on a large pedestal and has an elaborate parikara and is carved in the round. It was originally at Karambolim, a coastal town of Goa. When the Portuguese arrived and started destroying Hindu temples and images en masse, Many devotees spirited the images of their gods to faraway secluded places, beyond the reach of the Portuguese. 
The image of Brahmat, Brahma Karmalis, is one such image. The place of its original temple is preserved in the name of the present location, Brahma Karmali. This proves two points, that a Brahma temple existed and was in worship as late as the mid-16th century AD in Goa, and that it had enough devotees who could muster the courage and the resources to smuggle it into safer territories. Kamal Basti, presented by Vineet Bhojanavar, is one of the oldest Bastis in Belga. The whole Basti is in the middle of a beautiful garden. It is one of the main tourist attractions in Belga. Kamal Basadi, also known as Kamal Basti, is a 10th century Jain temple built under the reign of Ralta dynasty. The temple was built in 1204 AD by Bichirja, a minister of Kartaveria IV. 200 years ago, the idol of Lord Neminath was found in the jungle. The temple was built inside the Belgaum fort along with Chiki Basti, which is the present time remains of a ruin. The name Kamal Basti is derived from the appearance of the temple as a lotus with 72 petals. Each petal consists of the name of 24 Tirthankaras for each period carved on them. Today, the monument has become a monumental structure representing the Chalukya style of architecture. The Vasanta Mandapa is an addition to the Uma Maheshwara Shrine of the Bhogan Nandishwara Temple Complex. Sai Prapti presents a temple that has the stamps of five Indian ruling dynasties, namely the Cholas, Gangas, Hoysalas, Pallavas and the Vijayanagara kings. The temple portrays a melody of styles. The pillars, the ceilings, the statuettes, shrines, the deities inside them and the infinite carvings have a distinct flavor of each of their architectural styles. Of the three temples inside, the Arunachaleshwara temple represents the childhood days of Shiva while the Uma Maheshwara and Bhoganandishwara temples represent his youth. Thank you, Karen. So those were the 15 exhibits that we were very hard-pressed to bring to the finals. Um, I'd like to just ask Madhu uh, a few questions about a few of the exhibits. We were going to have breaks in the middle where I could maybe ask him, but we didn't want to, you know, uh, disturb the magic of, of each of these items. Um, Madhu, would you come online? Yes, I'm here. We saw we uh, saw those adhoka muda moldings at the beginning. Those uh, long vertical uh, moldings. What are those uh, creatures called? And uh, the photogrammetry came out uh, pretty nicely, right? So, what is it that these kids might have done to make it happen? Yes, sir. So, uh, so Karen, do you want to take that? Yeah, so those creatures, as pointed out by Siddhi Ma'am during our uh, jury interaction. They're called vialas and they're like a chimeric sort of animal with different body parts belonging to different animals. So these are were kind of mythological creatures that so you we find. Just look at now. that artifact when we discuss it. Is it possible to scroll back? Um, uh, yeah, I will share my screen, sir. Okay. okay. So I'll just share with you that it was great fun uh, interacting with the kids and the jury members because it made history so much more interesting when you can talk to somebody who actually knows about the stuff. And these kids have come up with all these amazing things that we don't get to see normally. And it just opens up the world in a totally new way and makes conversations so much more scintillating and exciting. Normally adults talk about not very exciting things, but when you have these things come from the kids, it forces you to think. Yeah, so this is the artifact that I just discussed uh, and this mythical uh, creature. So what's it called? The Vyala, you said? Vyala, yeah. Okay, that's um, what we learned from. The screen is not, uh, like, it's black. Let me try sharing it again. Yeah. Yeah, I also can't see anything. Okay. 
Is this better? Yes, yes, yes. So Fine. they've got they've got all the details in this. At first, we thought it was uh, a dragon and all sorts of weird things, but uh, uh, then we sort of were told that that uh, it's a viala. And and there's an animal at the bottom, which is a boar, right? A wild boar, I'm told. Or oh, this is an elephant. An elephant, yes, yeah, sir. Okay. And then we had the other thing that uh, that Mukut and Dagger, the Brahma Vishnu. And this artifact is quite small, actually. So uh, uh, it's quite interesting to, to uh, discover how does one create an exhibit around a small artifact? Huh. Yes, sir. So uh, let me just share my screen and show you how it looks like. Give me one second. Let me set up. So here, Madhu is actually engaging with this through the Blender uh, software, which, which we've uh, taught the kids. Yes, my screen is visible, correct? Yes, yes. All right. So uh, basically, uh, so I'm a student of architecture. And uh, this artifact particularly is quite small, if you see, because it is a mukut and it is uh, in the scale of a human head. So uh, when you create an exhibit for such small uh, artifacts, you need to uh, like make it so that the people who visit the museum go close to the artifact. That is why it is not uh, like uh, against the wall or something. It is separated from the wall and it is at a level where children can also see it from their point of view. And the adults who are a little taller, they can uh, like lean forward and uh, look at the artifact in that manner. Whereas the, uh, uh, the additional information about that artifact is on the wall. So that way the segregation of the crowd is taking place. So some people who want to uh, read more about the artifact will go next to the poster. Whereas the artifact itself is a little separate. That way you can do some crowd control. Okay, then there Thank was another thing, right? There was those uh, those copper plates with inscriptions. Yes, sir. Copper plates, uh, right? copper so, grants. So I was just thinking that how do archaeologists actually discover which dynasty has uh, made these things? Uh, did we ask our historian uh, friends? Uh, Karen? Could yeah, so uh, basically they would see the seal and uh, kind of recognize what emblem would, you know, correspond with what dynasty. And uh, in our case, it was a Cholan, uh, you know, uh, grand, copper grand, and we could see their emblem of the tiger. So that's usually how an archaeologist would try. So we have Girish Dhut who's saying, saying uh, something here. So would, uh, uh, I think Siddhi Ma'am would like to in, uh, like say something about this. Yeah, Siddhi. Yeah, as Karen pointed out, usually the emblem that's there on the copper plate uh, ground is usually the first indicator. And of course, apart from that reading... And the language. That, yeah, reading the inscription itself would help us because at the beginning itself, you would ideally have uh, the name of the ruler, the place, the time period because um, our ancient tradition was um, the way we write dates today was not how it was practiced back then. They used to write, uh, you know, entire time period as to which um, uh, prahar of the day and which season and um, uh, which... Uh, month it would be so lunar month and everything would be mentioned right at the beginning because after all the main uh, idea of giving a grant was to also highlight uh, the contribution of the donor so once you read it i think that's um, the easy giveaway and the symbol would be the first, the first so i have a question about that residency thing which is uh, something from uh, uh, our colonial past. Uh, any idea who that person was and what he was doing at the table, kind of, you know, throwing his body backwards like this? Yeah, so uh, his name was Henry Lawrence and he was one of the commissioners from the British, uh, you know, army and all that who would stay in the residency. And in the picture, he's actually wounded by a bullet 
and that's kind of his final you know position of death and he was also buried on the grounds of the residency and he still remains there in the residency cemetery so yeah this is the sculpture and i think if you go close enough you can see the bullet wound that inflicted him yeah oh that hole is a bullet wound yeah. <laughs> i thought that was a... it's supposed to kind of show the bullet wound we have a maithili who is just about to leave because uh, she had another engagement any uh, thoughts on this uh, maithili before you go on any of the artifacts yeah no i think this was uh, really interesting for me i am seeing i think almost all of these for the first time i really enjoyed them and i think it's great that the students are able to put together so many new things and uh, learn so much so yeah uh, no what particular was interesting comment to that. us is that i was fascinated when we were sort of going through each yeah. of these it's like these kids have gone gone off and they've discovered a kind of treasure and they are sharing it with you and then you are having such fun trying to understand what that is all about and that's how history should be history should yeah. be like the so, hood and it's and you know discover. yeah so one more thing i would have liked to see maybe in the next editions is i really wanted to see why did the students pick this particular thing for example was it some neighborhood temple they happened to see was it a vacay they took was it something they read i think that story of how they came across because i'm really curious like right? these are not all mainstream things that people would normally know at their age so i'm just wondering you know how did they come across all of these things i think that would be sort of an interesting perspective to add in the future editions so this point about them why they cho- chose the artifact they've actually documented it in the research article that we asked them okay to okay so okay. yeah it's all on the website okay, okay. Okay, if you want if you to you know uh, okay, kind of i'll take a look when yeah. you're curious so all through this thing that was sort of the thing at the back of my mind as to how did they come across such a rare thing right so i will definitely check it out thank no, you no maithili that's the interesting point right the students chose artifacts which are close to them maybe it's in the same city on the same neighborhood yeah yeah right and uh, that's how they chose it or some family member thought that something was interesting and they went for it yeah and that's what we found very interesting because they are like you know sleuthing and bringing out interesting things observations about the world around us which we never pay any heed to we are so wrapped up in our mundane lives typically that we miss out all the magic which is around us exactly yeah. yes so it's so quite I, interesting so i had yeah. some more questions but i don't want to hog uh, question time maybe others of our guests might also have some uh, uh, questions uh, seema ji um, uh, dinesh yeah Ian. i would like to open the floor to anyone who would like to share their experience with the young sir we would also like our guests of honor oh, to we yeah. can i just uh, say something here please do please do um i would have wanted to learn a little more before trying to sound impressive but i could not resist myself because you know kavi i don't know how you or other senior members who are present here studied history but when i was a school kid and i did not formally study history beyond that for me history was just a bunch of textbooks and nothing but written text with just occasional black and white images and you know as little as i've understood knowledge and learning and it supplies as much to history as it does to mathematics that a good picture or a good image is worth a thousand words and when you bring these images in these formats using technology they tend to come alive they begin to start telling their own stories because they spur your imagination and you begin to visualize what could have happened why for instance that that englishman who shot in the chest there all kinds of things that you can begin to speculate till you actually find out the facts that wets your curiosity and you learn only when your curiosity is wetted also there are so many things that have been brought together and gives a new dimension literally and metaphorically to history and i think this should be true for all other disciplines so i think there's a new pedagogy that is being presented here kavi and fabulous stuff finally i i 
I, I am not a professional historian by any stretch of imagination, but what little I knew, I was told that the only Brahma temple in India is at Pushkar. But I just learned through your presentation here that there was obviously a Brahma temple in Goa and the, the image, the statue still survives. So, so, so obviously there must have been many other places where they must have worshipped Brahma. Anyway, that's all I had to say. Thanks, Kavi. Dinesh, this is actually brings up a very interesting point in the sense that the process that we've started can be actually revolutionary and the children can be revolutionizing the study of history. By discovering stuff, they are like an army of little historians all over the place, discovering stuff. Now, which the, the elders now have to sort of uh, come to terms with, so to speak. So for this, I'd like the um, response has been or questions that, that she might have about um, our process. Seema ji. Well, I think that it's fascinating that these guys can do this. You know, because they can make 3D images of uh, varied artifacts from very small daggers to larger artifacts like the Chaturmukha Linga and even the uh, uh, Brahma with the entire, uh, you know, galaxy of uh, deities in the uh, Pratibha uh, or the Prabha Mandala that's around it. So I think the fact that they can do this you know, and uh, it brings up the possibilities of actually uh, creating repositories of these 3D images uh, of they can go out and do local histories, you know, which is very important that if they can document local and, re and then collect it together to make regional histories or even site histories, that would actually be a fantastic addition because if it's on the net, Anybody can actually, without not uh, without having to go to that place, be able to witness how that thing would have looked in context. The one thing that I would have liked them to do more, and perhaps because of paucity of time, you were not able to present it, is to contextualize the objects a little bit more. You know, because uh, that is very important to any history of an object. You know, there are two kinds of histories that one can do with an object. One is to look at it as just an object, but the other is to contextualize it into the, the time and space in which it was actually made. So I think that would help. For example, the one that uh, excited uh, the, your curiosity, which was the land grant copper plate. Uh, now, if they were able to also say that how this copper plate really is uh, is central to the economic structure. You know, what does it tell us about the economic structure? It will have information at various levels. It will tell not, us, not only tell us about the dynasty, but it will tell us about village boundaries, for example. Can they map those village boundaries? Uh, you know, that would be, you know, they can extend this into that. And, you know, where were the village boundaries here? Put it on onto the geographical space thereof. Uh, if there might be a temple that is mentioned, some of the communities to which this grant was made may still exist. The Brahmanas or the Agraharas, or the Brahmadeyas, you know, they may still exist. So they can actually, you know, what the students can do is they can kind of, you know, make these connections and then the object becomes far more than an object. You know, it tells us so many other histories. Maybe it tells us about a festival that was being performed uh, and this was granted during that festival, you know, you mentioned the date and so on and so forth. So each object has a, a history beyond itself. So that's that's one thing that I really liked and, 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 you know, would have, you know, I think maybe later they can actually do that. Simaji, they've actually tried to do it already, but it's quite yeah. interesting. You're already making them in your mind compete against your master's students. No, no, I'm not. I, I just want them to, kind of, because it's in the textbooks. It's in the 12th class up to the class. Yeah, the 12th so class these are the 7th standard and 8th standard. Oh, they're 7th standard and 8th standard. Oh, then they've done a fascinating job. Then Is they've it? done a fan fantastic job. So I was just trying to see what was there till the 12th century. I'm, I'm saying that that this whole thing we've discovered through our project-based learning pedagogy, yeah. that these limits that we set to what students can do and cannot do in schools are totally yeah. artificial. Absolutely. But what they've done is fantastic. That They were able to manipulate the technology and 
and to use this i think if they can just go out and do this for, for no, you know Simhaji, not only that we've not okay. demonstrated to you the research reports it's all up on the website they've actually researched okay. everything we've introduced them uh, as to what research means how to okay. do research how to cite your uh, sources and stuff like oh, that lovely. right so all these things are there in fact this can be made more rigorous and i'll i'll bet you that the kids will do a better job than anybody else because if you tell them this is the way to do it they'll do it just that way right I so think that is lovely and the, i think if the class teachers and and you and everybody else can help us as historians uh, you know because what they can create is is fascinating museum of ideas you absolutely. know absolutely you fact, know i think that's really with the help with your help and with uh, with uh, professor dinesh uh, here and others mm-hmm. we wanted to go one step many steps beyond actually first of all mm-hmm. creating a repository mm-hmm. and run this competition more widely so yeah. students are doing it as part of their normal mm-hmm. work and i was speaking to ian about hey why don't we get british students involved yeah and use eantra as a platform for indian students to learn british history through brit kids eyes and vice versa okay. and have some kind of interaction ian i think we should carry on that discussion uh, i think it's really useful um but what it's powerfully reminded me of is a project that we had in the uk in fact exactly when you and i were, were working together at oxford so in 1984 to 1986 i don't know if you remember this there was a a national uh, project run by the bbc to collect data uh from school children and it was compiled onto the technology of the day which were laser discs um so the it was called the doomsday project and it was to celebrate the 900th anniversary of the doomsday book which was the first proper census of england um back in the 11th century uh and there was over a million children involved in collecting this data from their own localities schools families um and uh 9000 schools and this was compiled into two laser discs um a community laser disc which was very much the sort of material you've got here but in 1986 technology um and uh a national disc as well so it'd be really informative to look at that because uh it it was both a success and a failure um the, the success because it it motivated the entire nation so uh, over a, a million people um contributed to to this um pair of of laser discs it was a huge amount of effort to put it together the technology of the time uh couldn't process that amount of data uh so it, a lot of software had to be invented and methods invented to to make these this work um but and and it was fabulous for a while but then because of moore's law technology advances and these laser discs became impossible to to play that the, the players disappeared the the technology itself only lasted a few years in the in the marketplace i think there was a an attempt to rescue the data in in 2011 there was something called doomsday reloaded but it just brought back to me two things one is that this material is incredibly powerful it's just wonderful you've seen that the motivation you get from kids and their families when interacting with real things real memories real people uh it it it's it's inspirational it's powerful and it doesn't matter whether the artifact is some little local family heirloom or a national treasure between those two extremes these artifacts can carry a real story and these are stories that deserve to be told and retold and when you do it through technology there can be unexpected problems over time as there were with this laser disc project not not only with the the obsolescence of 
technology them, itself, where you, you can't buy the discs anymore uh, or the players. Um, but also because, again, because of Moore's law, we've had we've got used to very high resolution pictures now, huge amounts of data. Uh, whereas in 1986, uh, these two discs were a total of four gigabytes, um, and so the the photographs are, are quite low resolution compared with what we're used to now. So there's that sort of obsolescence as well. So I think there's a really interesting idea here, which is worth um, pursuing and expanding because it's motivational at the time. But it would also be interesting to think that this could build into something that could exist over time. I mean, this, this is India's history um, written from a different place. It, it shouldn't go the way uh, that the BBC Doomsday Project went. There might be some interesting ways of making this real and everlasting. Just a thought. That's very interesting. Ian, one more thing that you pointed out, which we did think of, is that there's a there's a total paradigm shift here in the sense that, you know, there's a lot of history in family heirlooms. And Absolutely. That came out in the last edition of the competition where, where kids came up with family heirlooms like swords and stuff like that, which their great, great, great grandparents used to uh, wield. And yeah. they wrote stories around it. So there must be a lot of historical artifacts which are not available to us, to the public, which is there. No, it's in, in, totally unknown. Absolutely. And that could uh, that could bring alive a totally different way of studying history, number one. Number two is that a lot of the, um, the temples, because we don't pay heed to our national monuments because we have too many of them. We have grade A, a uh, heritage sites. We have grade two, grade three, God knows how many grades. But a lot of the unprotected sites of which there are many are kind of looted and the artifacts find their way to uh, museums and collections abroad. And this could be a good way to centralize at least a uh, uh, three-dimensional rendition which can make itself available yeah. itself available for study. Right? So that's pretty uh, interesting. I think you found a wonderfully rich seam of gold to mine here. Great. This, this, this could run and run. Yeah. So I've been getting some messages on my chat from some kids who said, why isn't our artifact there? And that's a sad thing. You know, we didn't want to just have uh, first, second and third prize. We wanted to show the very interesting work that almost all the teams have done. In fact, all teams have done. But in the paucity of time, uh, respecting the limited time that we have, we didn't want to have a six-hour function, otherwise nobody will come. To keep it to two hours, we had to sort of cut down the number. But we shall put all these things up on the website and make it available to everybody. I think that's the least we can do uh, for the students, along with their research reports and uh, things like that. I wondered if any of our other friends here would like to sort of make any comments about this before we just move on to the valedictory. Just just one <laughs> last point, Kavi, with your permission. That I, yes, I don't see anything around coins. Was that ah. different? Ah, so we did coins in the last edition. In fact, we had two separate exhibits. One was coins from Bhutan, ah. from the Royal Academy. And we had, in fact, uh, uh, there was a lot of Bhutanese interaction in the last edition where we had almost seven uh, exhibits from Bhutan, amazing exhibits, all of them. And one was on coins. And then we had one Indian exhibit on coins. Okay. okay. It was also very interesting. Anybody else? Yeah. Would any of the students like to share their experience or anything like that? Students tend to be very quiet. So, okay. So what I'd like to do is that if if uh, we can just uh, ask, yeah, we have Namish Chopra here. I think he's the guy whose exhibit didn't make it here. Yeah, Namish, we'll let you say um, your bit. Yes. So thank you, sir, like for organizing the event, which I think was very good because like, with this event, we could connect to our studies, obviously. And we could also discover, not only with our project, but all of the people who've, dis who've displayed here, all the sites and all the, the wonders and magics of India, which are somewhat unknown to the common people. So uh, 
like a very positive feedback to all all of the team of eantra and i think it was a very good event thanks namesh that's appreciated so um what i'd like to do now is that i'd like uh, uh, both uh, uh, professor seema and uh, professor dinesh to just uh, sum up this thing before we go into the valedictory and we hand out uh, the different sorts of awards that we sort of innovated if you like because each artifact was very good very difficult so we had to come up with innovative names for each of the awards so we could give as many awards as uh, possible so uh, seema ji i'd like you to uh, say a few words to kind of help us uh, conclude this bit of the uh, yeah. presentation yeah, I, of the event i just went to the site and saw the research and it's really impressive for uh, for anybody not just school children it's a very impressive amount of research that we've done and i think that's uh, and as you said that for objects that are not in the museums yeah uh, which are actually lying around in local neighborhoods or in um panchayat houses or wherever this kind of documentation would be priceless uh, and i think the children have are really innovative when it comes to uh, even research what i little that i read uh, of one object they are able to bring out uh, aspects which don't strike researchers you know it's not obvious to researchers because we are used to particular ways of seeing an object and they are able to see it with new fresh eyes and curiosity which i think is very very important also technology how they are able to marry technology to just visuality you know and, and uh, that uh, i was uh, observing in that one object and i'm i'm very curious to see how they've done it with other objects because i've just just seen just one object so uh, you know they're able to uh, not just map it or or to photograph it but also uh, you know the way they've diagrammatically seen that shows that there is a very strong connection with the visuality of the object and i think that's very important uh, and uh, to just re not just reconstructing but also reimagining the object uh, and that i think you've done you you know obviously it's a very very innovative project and so so what would your message be to us uh, uh, cbse and other school principals oh that they should encourage these kind of things and actually take their students out of the classrooms and uh, you know help them engage with their local environments provide them with facilities where they can connect to platforms such as yours and and just uh, let the students have curiosity you know about their history about their culture and about their environments uh, local environments which are full of all these things uh, and not concentrate so much on the key words you know what if a child misses writing a key word in an exam as long as he, he or she has understood the concept behind something uh, an object and its history or or history and then its objects uh, the other way around also that would be a a way forward i think so so would this help them get into your department as they grow older yes very much so definitely but you yes. just look at exam marks don't you uh unfortunately yes but if it was a research program we would definitely look into something like this uh we don't want to do it like don't blame us okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know it's a system and we should we need to you know actually change the system No, but think... but but i feel i feel fairly confident that once kids have been touched so yeah that their 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 perception of their own academic work will change and that will naturally have its own outcome and we'll have a very different kind of individual emerge at the end of their education i suspect yeah. because most of my personal formative experiences have been at this age Yeah. and 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 the uh, most vivid memories are when we've been taken on site visits and we actually have experiential uh, uh, you know uh, classes and events and experiences of various kinds where they take us take us to a site and stuff like that it makes a big impression oh yes oh yes since i have a school going daughter 
who engages with history all the time and actually questions all her textbooks extensively. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know that, uh, and she's not allowed to do that in writing. So I know how much, she, you know, somebody like her would have enjoyed doing a project like yours uh, because it allows her to step beyond the classroom or it would have allowed her to step beyond the classroom and actually uh, bring those questions into a form where she's, uh, which allows her to actually um, form these questions which are not allowed inside the classroom. So that's very interesting. We need to change a lot of things. So yeah. before we ask uh, Dinesh to close this thing, I'd like to have Ian's words before we move on to Dinesh. Wherefore, sir, and uh, how can we bring England into the mix? You're muted. Yeah, I, d- I don't know how to do it, but that it should be done seems like a very worthwhile project. Um, I think that it can succeed um, and, and that 1980s um, doomsday project shows that this can be scaled to a massive level, um, to, even to a national level, which that one was. Um, a lot of effort went into it and, and in a sense, uh, all that's left is the memory of having done it. The digital artifacts that were created in that project um, didn't last much longer than the laser disc itself, which was only a few years. It was a project to bring it all back and bring it into the digital world in 2011. And it was put online uh, until I think 2018. And then that was taken away um, because people weren't looking at it. Um, and I think one of the reasons for that was that it was all old, low fidelity photographs and small amounts of data, which just seemed tiny by comparison with the amounts of data and the quality of photos and videos that we're now used to online. So this question of technology obsolescence, obsolescence and data obsolescence um, needs to be attacked somehow so that I, so that the artifacts that are created in this virtual reality and the stories can continue. Uh, in fact, I think I might have just had an idea in saying story, because of course we do preserve stories for millennia. Simple mm-hmm. text-based stories are still around with us from hundreds and even thousands of years ago. Uh, So why is it that those have continued to exist and to be told and retold, whereas something like the Doomsday Project, um, which had uh, photographs and videos and some virtual walkthroughs, um, disappeared after a few years. So I I think there's an interesting theme that, that could be explored here, how to build something that not only is fun, exciting and relevant, uh, and highly educational for the people involved in it now, but maybe there's a possibility of producing something which can itself grow over time and become um, a, a national resource. Uh, and I think that's independent of what country we're talking about. It doesn't matter whether it's India or England, because um, we're, we're talking about things which are deeply relevant to humans and to the our societies and our families uh, and, and our history. So it would be nice to think that uh, this could be scaled both internationally and in size. So I think we should carry on this discussion. I don't have the answers right now. I've got some problems, but um, they're only to be overcome. Great. I think that's given us a kind of direction. I've seen this as an international project. And plus, for abstracting away technology, there's always the cloud. Right? Hopefully, we've passed on the onus of updating the technology to the cloud vendors. It does part of the, the job. There's no doubt about that. Um, but then there's the, the quality of the data itself. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, I, uh, before I go on to Dinesh, thanks, Ian. 
appreciate those comments. They've kind of widened our horizons, right? Which is a good sign. Um, I'd like to ask Siddhi to give her comments because she's been there with us from the very beginning as a local uh, expert historian. So what's her experience been? And uh, we are hoping that we'll continue to have a collaboration with uh, Simaji and yourself. But uh, over to you, Siddhi. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Yeah. Uh, so I think the uh, most important thing that I had to keep reminding myself while seeing all these presentations was that we are looking at um, uh, all the kids who are from 7th to 12th standard because um, they kept uh, increasing our expectation bar so much that we wanted to uh, wanted them to do much more. As I think Seema ma'am was also trying to suggest, you know, that context should be there. So many other things that could be brought out. But I think through the uh, whole session, I had to keep reminding myself the, um, the age group that I was looking at. And I think they've done a fabulous job. And uh, Professor Arya, I request you to do something similar for our master students as well. I think <laughs> they definitely need something like this as well. <laughs> Yes, in fact, we'll get them to work with the school students and we'll make the school students put them through their paces. Yes, <laughs> yes I think that's a good idea. So if they mentor the school students, then that process will actually happen. That's an interesting insight. Let's try it out. Yes, that would be great. <laughs> that's interesting. Uh, any students would like to give their uh, feedback? We have a bunch of youngsters here. Be bold. Right, your work has been celebrated and commented. Can you give us an idea of how it's how it's changed you guys? Anybody like to uh, venture or volunteer an idea? Yeah, Ashwarya. Yeah, like the intro program has changed uh, in have you been given a change in me a lot like before when I used to learn history in school classes it was like the boring subject uh, and the perspective in my mind was uh, I just hate this subject but after this competition the uh, like studying history became more interesting and uh, and studying um, uh, things related to history became interesting that's inter that's that's very interesting to know, and I'm glad that we've had that effect. Uh, there are some other youngsters here, like Niharika. Would you like to say something? Yes, sir. So, uh, uh, when before in even in my class, when I used to study a history subject, in my perspective, it was the boring subject ever. And uh, even my friend used to tell that uh, it's the it's very boring subject. I just uh, uh, wanted like I would don't want to study this subject right now. But uh, after uh, when I came in this competition and I started to learn the history, I uh, started to um, means uh, make the models and uh, write more uh, research about the history, and I got more. Uh, more interest in history and it uh, now I don't think that history is uh, very boring it's like a fun subject and whenever I hear something about history when teachers some teachers something about uh, any um, Kadambas or uh, Chalukya something about that history I feel like to go to that place or the temple or the places which is related to what teachers just said and I like to, uh, I would like to more research about the place or the place. You know, Nyarika, these teachers here like Siddhi yes. and Simaji would be uh, very thrilled to hear this. That, okay, finally yes. we might be able to sort of make kids excited about history. Okay, so we have someone here. I'll take the last one here, Akshita, before I move on to uh, the next tree. Ak Akshita, you've been smiling away. Yes. So what's been your observation? Do you have something <laughs> different to say from them? Uh, yeah, uh, well, this competition really helped us learn a new software that is Blender. And uh, working on Blender really, um, I really enjoyed working on it, doing, uh, making objects, making a museum. The whole museum was 3D and uh, it was really fun and a very new thing. So do you think this Blender training could help you in other subjects also as you go along? 
yeah well uh, like uh, in my team some of us wants to go in designing career and uh, blender is really helpful in the animation path so uh, so it will be very helpful for us okay thank you uh, last namish and then i uh, will move on to close namish yes sir so like i already gave my feedback but i i want to give you like the team a suggestion okay sir uh, as many uh, of the guests which are present here they mentioned that like we can collaborate other grades higher grades with us so i think that would be very good and we can also collaborate like other countries or even other institutions who don't really specialize in history but do want to learn something in this That's project cool idea we'll 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 actually explore that so our friend professor dinesh singh has been quietly absorbing everything um perhaps uh, we might uh, lean on you to kind of give it a suitable closure before we move on to the valedictory dinesh ji well kavi i mean there isn't much left for me to say this is extremely <laughs> exhilarating and uh, i can see that uh, there is a paradigm shift in the context of how students can visualize history and absorb it and be excited by it let me just mention a few things quickly i know we need to move on to the valedictory and as i said most things have been said you know one i am not aware as to why this is not happening but the national education policy for school education does talk about this business of hands on project based learning it deemphasizes textbook and rote learning textbook based rote learning and the difficulty that most teachers seem to have is that they're not able to grasp how they could move to other means when they talk about project based hands on connected to the real world teachers are unable to visualize with demonstrations like these that have happened we can make good beginnings so i believe that the seeds of how the policy could be implemented at least at the junior school levels and we can move up gradually because you cannot change everything all at once this is how we should do it and to add substance to my assertion here these things not in the context of history but in the context of other multi and transdisciplinary activities has been tried the pedagogy and the way you make technology come to your aid and this business of what seema i think suggested mixing or, or was it siddhi i think who said that you take your postgraduate students and mix them with school students we have done that my colleagues and i have done that for years together kavi to mm. great effect so when you create a group and you create a good, good healthy mix of people interested in technology in communication in history in, in whatever and bring them together to look at a problem and bring them from different levels of their education great things happen so that's one thing that i think you you're on the right track I, i can vouch for it the other thing that <clears throat> i wanted to add was when you and ian were talking about internationalizing this i think uh, this is something that must happen sooner the better and you know knowledge knows no boundaries knows no barriers so let this technology begin to maybe we could start by creating a virtual channel youtube museum channel something and let people start adding their bits in that context <clears throat> i was once lecturing to a bunch of people online this was an international webinar during the time of covid and i was telling them this is what you should do make history come alive and i took the example of alexander's journey through persia and there are there is enough material available along the lines of what you have done kavi on youtube there are marvelous bbc documentaries that talk about these things and there is other stuff 
And there are these local histories. I thought it was Ian who talked about looking at those local histories. One of your distinguished panelists said it. This business of local histories, local stories coming alive in the context of Alexander's journey, you see how the local people have viewed his adventure, his conquest of Persia, and what they thought of the whole thing. When you go to the Qutub Minar in Delhi, even now, I've, I haven't been there in a few years, but I made umpteen visits to the Qutub Minar, and this is a huge project for your students, and I can create a group here. They could go to the Qutub Minar and just document the local history perspective of the Qutub Minar. Amazing. This is just a perspective. History is about how you view things with different perspectives. So all these things do come alive. And right now, while we were doing this, Kavi, I was wondering, you know, what would happen? So you ask Seema if they will be admitted to her program. Much as Seema is enlightened and would like to do that, the true philosophy of the national education policy for higher education has not yet, in spite of Seema, in spite of you, in spite of me and others, has not yet absorbed that this is the way forward. For instance, how will a child be admitted into university now for the central universities? You have to go through a written exam, central university at whatever eligibility test or something. That's not going to recognize all these activities that your students are doing. That's not going to give them credit. It's not going to spur them on because they know this will not be counted for admission purposes. Somewhere we need to gently nudge, even build a pressure lobby to get the authorities to begin to recognize that also. That is very, very important. And you know, at this point in time, I am working almost round the clock with a bunch of very gifted colleagues drawn from different disciplines into building a new undergraduate program. And the program is trying to dissolve boundaries in many ways and it's sort of going to connect to school and also to research, but in a seamless way. And all these things will fit into that, Kavin. My final thing, you could build a whole program by getting your students to visit places of pilgrimage where all those pundits sit with those manuscripts we trace the family history of almost everyone that we know. If you give them your name, if you go to Haridwar, or if you go to Rameshwaram, or some such place like that, or, you know, you will find that there are pandit. They'll ask you what region is your village from, and they'll locate a pandit who will trace your family history when your ancestors visited that place. It's an amazing way of data keeping, and it unfolds an amazing history. And here you have a whole project before you, which will keep you occupied for years on end. So try and add that to your list. Thank you. Great, Sinesh. As, as ever, uh, very thought-provoking. And I think uh, uh, this, is, this is the start of a very interesting uh, conversation. And um, uh, Simaji, Siddhi, Ian, whether you like it or not, I think you're part of it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and we shall continue it. Ian is on... Uh, is 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 engaged with us on other fronts because uh, we are looking at Yantra and having a chip design vertical right in it and uh, to use a lot of open source software to democratize uh, chip design using youngsters in the country. Do that, do that. So these are exciting things that we are up to and history, although it seems very disjoint and separate, I believe it's not. There's a unity in all these things which you have yet to uh, point out and I think this critical thinking ability which is there which history trains you in very well right is something that the rest of the engineering subjects can only be enriched by right this 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 more emphasis on uh, on humanities and things like that without much ado i'd like to move on to the next phase to properly close the event we have a valedictory where we shall celebrate and 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 uh, spot the innovative awards that we are giving this time so over to you karen yeah so, um, without any further ado, let's go into the valedictory ceremony. Uh, we, I would be honored to felicitate our winners and we'll start off with the category award winners. Um, the best exhibition design goes exhibit. to... Exhibit yeah, design. Exhibit design goes to Vineet Bhojanavar. Is he here? 
He's from yes, Saint Mira's High School, and his artifact was the Kamal Basti, where he had made the entire temple as well. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. The best storytelling award goes to Niharika Sanu from N. V. Hardwarkar English School from Karnataka. Her artifact was the idol of Lakshmi Narayana. The best photogrammetry award goes to Chatur Mukhalinga. And this is team uh, by Afia, Tanya, Nandini, and Akshata from Mayor School. Give them a round very of applause. This exhibit was most interesting, actually. Yeah. And very well uh, captured, I must say. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very high resolution. The best presentation award goes to Aishwarya Dut from Sri Satya Sai Vidya Vihar, Indore. And her artifact was the Ahilya Bai Holkar statue. She had a very nice presentation during the jury interaction. So that was what it was. Now we have two rare find awards. Uh, one goes to Sai Pranav uh, for his Brahma of Goa. And he's from Sharada Mandir School. And uh, is he here? I don't think he's here. Sai, this is very interesting if you're there because as, as uh, Professor Dinesh has pointed out, he's discovered today that uh, Brahma temples not only in the north but also in Goa. So that's very thought-provoking indeed. Yeah. And uh, the next rare, award, rare find award goes to Arav Malik for his Brahma, Vishnu and Ganesh Mukut and Dagger. He's from Salwan Public School, Delhi. I think he's also over here. Yes, thank you so Very much. Good. Yes. Uh, good. Now, oh yes, best video award goes to Ishan Singhania for his Ashokan Rock Edict. And he's from Vibhya High School, Malad. The best research award goes to Remy Chauhan for her Lord Hariharas uh, research. She's from Navy Children's School. Is she present over here? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Nice yeah. Um, now, a few honorable mentions before we announce the first, second, and third prize winners. The first is the Tanjore toy by Aditya, Jedi, Prajesh, and Mohammed from Laurel Senior Secondary School. Your artifact was very unique. Uh, About the second, artifact, the story was very nice. They got yes. out life stories yeah. out of this, which we really yeah, appreciated. Yeah. Yes. The next honorable mention is Maz Khan for his residency. I'm sure a lot of people were captivated by the story of the uh, of Henry Lawrence. And In fact, if, if, if Maz is here, maybe he can explain why he chose this because that's a question that uh, Seema ji had, right? Maz, why did you choose this? Uh, is he here? Yes, yeah. sir. Uh, actually, uh, I'm, I am living in a residential school and uh, near the Lucknow it is. And uh, I was just researching about what the artifacts uh, in Lucknow. And then I came to know about residency. I went there and I saw all the monuments that were there. I was so much fascinated by it. And then I researched it on internet because there was no much information in that building. And then... Good, interesting. Very nice. Let's go on. And the next honorable honorable mention is the copper plate glass by Angeline, Jaden, and Chris from Madras Christian Public School, Tamil Nadu. Congratulations. Now, without, oh yeah, and Adhokam Uda Moldings by Sai Anish from Baldwin School. Is he here? This made us think a bit. <laughs> yes. Yeah, his unique sculptures were very captivating. <laughs> Yeah. That's the one with the elephant at the bottom. Yes. Yeah. And now we'll announce the third, second, and first prize in that order. The third prize goes to Team Aska for their Jagannath Tekri Stupa. Uh, they are Anshuman, Shristi, Anika, and Chris. And they are from Navy Children's School. Very good. Congratulations. The second prize goes to Raja Singh Kumar, again from Navy Children's School. And this is for his Ashoka Rock edicts. So he had two items there, not yeah. only one. Hmm? And the first prize 
drum roll everyone <laughs> it goes to oh wait i'm sorry i went back <laughs> it goes to sai prapti joshi for her pillars of the mandapa of bhoganandeshwara temple Great. and she is from national academy of learning so the first second and third prize winners i would like you all to you know say a few words if you all want sai would you like to say anything thank you so much for the first place it was a good experience this competition i learned a lot and uh, i hope i can take it forward from here these learnings great great yeah would uh, raja and team aska like to say anything they're from the same school so i think the school <laughs> which school is that the navy children school okay you guys have been hyperactive in the navy school why is that how come uh so our teacher introduced us to this competition yeah. and mm -hmm. 10 people from our school were selected for this and uh, we all got uh, we all we all uh, registered ourselves in the competition and we worked hard throughout okay. the 6 weeks and um, we reached this point yeah. so who was this teacher is she there so uh, uh, she's uh, with us right yeah. now it was uh, suchitra so ma'am and sapna bura ma'am yeah. our computer teachers for second okay a big hand to them yes sir definitely okay, done a good job uh, i'd like to mention my computer teachers while she's here in the meeting <laughs> oh okay nice uh miss jitna ma'am yeah so can she speak to us yes sir yes sir i'm here about your uh, own experience yes uh i would like to thank the team the guidance from you guys and also the prapti's effort uh just i was that as a motivation yes i did uh, she did well everything uh thank you so much for the team uh, congratulations prapti thank you thank you abilash i think this encouragement is uh, is extremely important and it's, yes. it's it's importance can't be understated anybody else who is the other team raja would you like to say something am i audible Yes, yes. Yeah. So I also would just like to thank the organization and all for the EMSA program. It was a, an eye-opening experience. Brought out a lot of the creativity and everything. So yeah, thank you for that. Raja, which school are you from? Navy uh, Children. The same as <laughs> Team Aska. Okay, so Navy Come Children. Come and please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. So I think, uh, but I. i'll let you in on a secret i don't think really first second and third works for these because i think all of them are winners absolutely and even the ones who not come in the interest of time we could not have all of them but you guys have done an amazing job right and and i think that should be celebrated which is why we got these very uh, distinguished guests here because we were we were convinced that we'll mesmerize them right and i think you guys have done it fully we have yeah yes yes absolutely absolutely fascinating yes so i'd like to just hand the floor over to uh, my colleague deepa who's been running this entire show so all the school projects are managed by her and she quietly manages the entire uh, show along with maddu who's our designer and he's the heartbeat behind the all the technology and the design inputs and all that kind of stuff he's a, a mdes a masters in design from uh, the industrial design center at iit bombay and karen here is a graduate of xavier's college right uh, siddhi would have been her teacher and uh, she joined us last year and she's beginning to sort of enjoy her work here i can see that so good to have you on board and deepa is been the kind of uh, the instigator of stuff we've grown these uh, school efforts around her because she's been really interested in working with school so deepa a few words and the vote of thanks from you please uh, sure sir thank you so much am i audible uh, no you're not audible oh my god <laughs> Okay, uh, now am I audible? Yes, you are. You are. Oh, that's why I'm so surprised. We'd like we we'd like Man uh, Madhu also to say a few words. Madhu, Karen, and then uh, Deepa. Madhu. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, Madhu. See. Yeah, am I, I audible? I don't yeah. think this is what he had in mind when he came to us because he was. I'd asked him to sort of lead our design shop on the project, 
but uh, we thought we utilize his skill in different ways madhu i feel that you actually got infected with this virus now so what's your reaction yeah. to this uh, so yeah i did my masters in design and then uh, i'm uh, specialized in industrial design but now i'm working in the education space what uh, this journey has taught me is that uh, like i didn't used to do photogrammetry before so i had to learn it and then learn blender also and then while teaching i got better at it and uh, we did the pilot edition and then the uh, uh, this edition also and what i see is a upward trend that children are getting smarter <laughs> they can manage themselves so we had a little difficulty in the pilot edition on training students but in this edition it got quite easy and uh, the children were pretty smart in handling all those other things and we started getting like more intelligent doubts and intelligent questions and uh, on a more uh, abstract level that was so thank you uh, you did an amazing job and we are grateful for your participation in with us on this journey thank you sai wants to say something they are the victims of your teaching <laughs> <laughs> okay she is clapping um karen uh yeah sir i would just like to say it's been a pleasure working with these students and uh, they're all so intelligent like reading their research papers and kind of comparing it to what i used to do in college is you know almost on the same level because at a school level i have learned that we don't really teach them how to do research and when you once you come to college you like push them into the deep end so i think that's something that they are picking up from school level only now so it's something that's really amazing coming from them even so, though they've not been so introduced these kids, to it before these kids are going to give a hard time to uh, professor seema and siddhi when they get to their hands because they yes yes very much so <laughs> they'll be having to actually work hard then yeah. <laughs> more hard <laughs> deepa uh, yes sir your video is off by the way <laughs> okay uh, so like it's been a wonderful journey throughout this whole competition and uh, like the kind of artifacts that we have re received plus uh, it is the persistence that we can say that has brought all those 15 teams to this uh, level so what i see in them is the persistence okay this artifact is not working okay i'll find out some other artifact and do my best so can do spirit persistence and the joy in doing the 3d the technology and history together is what we could see in them and uh, we congratulate all of you uh, who like you know it, like all 15 teams who are here are the winners and you have come so far so congratulations to all and thank you so much to sithi ma'am and seema ma'am for the history aspect that you have brought in in the students and yeah it's been really amazing the overall journey yeah yes yeah, sir And we can move on to the vote of thanks now, yes ma yes sure sure so we see happy faces today and uh, thank you all so on behalf of uh, the eantra team i would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to our esteemed guests jury members principals who are here with us and teachers and students for making this event really really a great success and uh, i would also like to thank each and every one who have joined with us uh, in the zoom call and also on our youtube live stream for making this a uh, memorable event and uh, surely we'll be in touch and we'll do something cool in the masters and college level 2 with seema ma'am and siddhi madam and uh, surely surely this uh, entire journey of the competition has been a learning experience not only for the students for us also 
because uh, the students who selected the artifact, we also worked on it. We also search about the history. So while they are doing a research, we are also doing a research on all those artifacts. And we got to know so many things about our rich heritage of our India. So uh, kudos to all the teams. We, we congratulate all. Hearty congratulations to all the 15 teams. We thank our uh, special jury members. We had this time, Professor Sugan Malhotra, Professor Siddhi Deshpande, and uh, Mrs. Richa Verma for your precious time and valuable impressions that you have brought in, especially in a field of history, technology, and uh, the connect with the curriculum that is there. Because today we could hear that students who found it really a boring, now they are finding it interesting. So this is a kudos moment for all of us. And uh, special, special thanks to uh, Professor Dinesh Singh, Professor Seema Madam, and Professor Maithili, and our uh, Professor Ian Page for your uh, precious time and your impressions in this event. And Ian, uh, Ian, just note that you've been named after the mascot now because the mascot <laughs> is called Ian, and now you're also called Ian. <laughs> Go on. Yes. Uh, yeah, and uh, we thank our Professor Kaviaria, Principal Investigator of Yentra Project. Thank you, sir, for your continuous support and guidance. And uh, special thanks to our uh, media team, Riti, Madam, and Anut, sir. Uh, are you there, Riti, Madam, and Anut, sir? Could you turn on your video? You've been very quiet. Any comments, Riti and Anut? Okay. Riti, Anuj, are you there? Okay. Okay, we'll move on. So the media, like they have been there with us in the discussion huddle, interacting with all the participants, their feedback and all the videos that are there on YouTube channel. It's their creativity. So thank you. Uh, Riti Ma'am and Anut sir for all the videos and I thank our uh, development team Madhu and Karen Mendes for your continuous support in terms of resources, in terms of guidance, in terms of night sessions. Thank you both of you and we thank Ministry of Education and IIT Bombay for hosting our project. So for all of you, for more information on school initiative, please visit school.e-yantra.org where you will see the latest updates about the competitions and about the events that we hold. Uh, thank you all once again. Thank you. Good evening to all of you. Over thank to you, you very sir. much. And thanks for joining us to make history. I think we've not only done history, but we also made history. And I think this is the start of a conversation which we shall take forward and do something really interesting with. Dinesh, Ian, Simaji, uh, Maithili, uh, Siddhi, thank you very much for being here with us. And let's thank make you. life more interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Thank, thank you, you for very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Bye. Good night. God thank bless. You. Thank Good you. Night. Thank you.